Have you ever wondered if primer seating really makes a difference? I did, and did a test. The results were shocking. Today's video is about primer seating, because as you know, I've been designing on a priming tool. And I had intended to produce this video solely for the patrons, because those same patrons are the people that funded the camera that you're looking at me through. They funded this microphone up here that I'm going to push out of the view for a moment. And they fund the software, especially the software that it takes to edit all these videos down to make a usable video that you guys watch on YouTube. Otherwise, these would be hours of me babbling trying to get the right words out. And I know you don't want to watch that. At the same time, they provide a great deal of funding that helped me do testing, like the testing that I did on these primers. So let me explain the problem. I designed a priming tool that will, with great precision, I mean half a thousandths precision, position a primer in the case, reference the case head, not the rim. It doesn't care how thick the rim is. That's the best part about the design. The question is whether that will make any difference in your shooting. Because I don't want to build and sell a tool just because it's cool and oh, it's greatly precise if it doesn't actually make a difference in the outcome of your shooting. Otherwise, it's just another expensive monument to how much money you can spend on your reloading equipment. And I don't want to be a part of that for you or for me for that matter. So the test is pretty simple. We start with the concepts that we've been taught over all these years. And those are that primers need to be seated until the feet of the anvil are touching the bottom of the primer pocket. And that we need to crush them some to sensitize the primers to make them fire well. But also not to over crush them because that creates flyers. We've all been told this. But how many of you have actually tested that? I hadn't, and I believed it because I had a little anecdotal experience that suggested that it might be true. But to do an actual test takes a little bit of planning, a little bit of effort, and a little bit of luck sometimes. And I managed to get everything but the luck. Let me explain. I took the 308 brass, the large primer brass that I've been using, and went to prime it with Federal 210M primers. But before I did that, I did two things to ensure best quality outcomes for my test, whether they make any difference or not. The first thing I did is I weight sorted the primers. I only ran one group of primers that were all the same weight, down to the milligram. Now that's a pretty tight tolerance and most likely, based on my other testing, not completely necessary, but I thought I'd just do it to satisfy everyone that I had done everything possible to minimize any primer compound weight difference effects. The next thing I did is I measured every primer, its freestanding height, because I have a surface plate back here and this really nice digital indicator. Why not measure them all? So I did. And I broke them into two groups. The first group we will call our ideal situation group. These are primers that stood between 128 and 128 and a half thousandths high on the surface plate. The other group was my worst case group. Those were the shortest ones and the tallest ones from the group I measured. And I actually removed the 127, 127 and a half, the 129 and 129 and a half from that. That way I took the entire middle out and used just the really short ones and the really tall ones. So I had one primer that was 1245. Yes, 124 and a half thousandths tall. One that was 125 and a half thousandths tall. Eight of them that were between 126 and 126 and a half tall. And then I had eight that were 130 to 130 and a half tall. And three of them that were 131.0 tall. So I had a great breadth of primer heights there. How do you get a consistent crush with primer heights like that? That was why I was doing the test. 
because I can position the primer reference the case head and the bottom of the pocket. But does that mean best results? Well, let's find out. What I did is I set up my priming tool to put the primers four and a half thousandths below the case head. Now these primer pockets were uniformed with a Sinclair uniforming tool to make sure that I had a primer pocket depth that was consistent. They were all 130 and a half thousandths deep, which means that with a 1280 primer, I was crushing them two thousandths. In other words, our theoretical ideal crush. I also, in a separate set of cases that came out of the same exact batch, put all the remaining worst case primers in, in a random fashion, all to the same depth though, and put them aside. So I didn't know which ones were short and I didn't know which ones were tall. It's a blind test. That way I don't get the yips when I'm shooting the rifle, trying to figure out what's going on. It just happens and whatever we happen to see is what we get. It's probably the most scientific way I can do things. Unfortunately, I have a very simple confirmation bias, just like everybody else on the planet, so I didn't want my shooting to show the confirmation bias. So I didn't know which ones were short and which ones were long. But let's consider what the shortest one was. At 124 and a half plus four and a half thousandths, is 129 thousandths. That's one and a half thousandths from the bottom of the pocket. The anvil wasn't even touching the bottom of the pocket. On the 125 and a half primer, it was about half a thousandths off the bottom of the pocket. Now, the 126s were just kissing the bottom of the pocket, and the 126 and a halves had half a thousandths of crush. Everything looks good so far, right? Now think about the 131s. The primer pocket is only 130 and a half deep, which means if I'm flush with the head, I have half a thousandths of crush. But I had another four and a half beyond that, so those were crushed five thousandths in the pocket. So we have a lot of things that could go wrong here, and that makes for a good test. So off to the range I went with the 308 f open rifle to do a little shooting. Now there's two things we're gonna assess in this test. The first is chronograph data. I wanna see if the ES and standard deviation, the extreme spread and standard deviation vary with the primer crush or position. I'm really quite curious about this. This worst case scenario should give me a pretty significant change in those numbers if there's actually a difference. The next thing we're gonna do is try to shoot groups side by side on the target and unfortunately, when I got there, this is where my luck ran out. There was a bit of mirage. The target was bouncing around quite a bit while I was shooting this. So I didn't get absolute precision in my aim point the way I really wanted to. But I shot the worst case scenario bullets aimed at the left edge of the 10 ring. And I shot the perfectly crushed rounds at the right hand edge of the 10 ring and everything went smashingly until I got to the 14th round of the worst case group and I aimed at the wrong side of the 10 ring and flung it into the wrong group. Here, I'll show you. Oh, I aimed that shot at the wrong spot. Okay, so the 14th shot from left, I aimed at the right hand aim point. So the nut behind the butt messed that one up. That's just the way it goes. We know that the elevation is on and the approximate point of impact relative to the point of aim is right in the group with the rest of the left group. So it isn't gonna increase the group size at all, which is good. But let's get to the results pretty quickly here because I don't wanna waste a bunch of your time. Looking at the two groups in their totalities, there is no fundamental difference in the group sizes. I wasn't trying to shoot a group, I was trying to shoot an aim point. That was the point of the test. Now on that left-hand group, it does seem to have clumped up in the X-ring a little bit more than the right-hand group did, but not significant. So looking at this in its totality, when we consider the velocity especially, and the warm temperatures, well, my N140 pushed me out the top of the node, and it didn't shoot as tight as I had hoped. On the other hand, the two groups are virtually identical in size, which shows that it didn't negatively impact the tune of the rifle. As a matter of fact, the worst case primers actually shot slightly better 
than the ideal crush primers, if you can imagine that. All right, second measure is velocities. Now, I tortured these numbers endlessly with statistics, but let me just give you the high points of this. The worst case scenario primers had an extreme spread of 30 feet per second. And now remember, I'm firing all of these out of one rifle in one long string. So I fired 42 shots consecutively out of one rifle. It got a little warm and the average velocity started to move as we were doing that. So you'll have to excuse the little bit higher ES. There was also an exacerbation from the increased air temperatures that made the velocity come up out of the node. But the ideal primers were 26 for the extreme spread. And I'm sure somebody out there has got their hands up in the air going, see, it makes a difference, it makes a difference. Hang on just a minute. Because that's not the total story. I wouldn't just say the ES is different and here, go do this. Uh, I got to be honest with you guys. It's not that simple. So let's resort to math. I know you guys hate math. Statistics can be your friend, but you have to know how to use them effectively. So we're going to look at this data in two different ways. We're going to start with an F test. An F test is a test for differences in variance in the data. In other words, variance being related to your standard deviation. The variance is just a standard deviation squared, as a matter of fact. So let's look at this. Using an F test with a 95% confidence and a hypothesis that they're actually the same, I can't reject that hypothesis based on these numbers. The F statistic is way too small to say that. So let's start moving the confidence level downward until we get a rejection of that null hypothesis, as we call it, the hypothesis that they're the same. It wasn't until I came down to a 75% confidence level that I could reject the hypothesis that they were the same. So there's a, there's a three out of four chance that there's a difference at the most. That isn't real comforting. So I looked at the data and decided to use a little more advanced test called a Levine test. And with this test, it does the same exact thing. Now, Excel doesn't have this built in the way it has the F test built in. So I had to do a little bit of uh, work with Excel to get the test done. The result of a calculation is then used with an ANOVA test to look at the data. In this case, we are looking for a P factor of less than 0.05, meaning a 95% confidence level. Our P was 0.68, way too big to suggest that there's actually a difference in the variance of the data. In other words, as far as statistics go, there is nothing statistically significant about the difference in the variance in the velocities. These could just be random accidents of velocity. The average velocity was slightly different between the two groups, but that could be explained as well because the test for that showed that they were the same as well. So all in all, what I've found is this. When you seat a primer into a case, whether the feet are actually touching the bottom perfectly or just grazing the bottom of the pocket, probably makes very little difference. Now, if you're a long way from the bottom of the pocket, you're going to get misfires. That's a known. We've done this before, and I've had them in the past. But on the other extreme, if you crush a primer, five thousands, it doesn't seem to have a negative effect on the primer's performance. Now, if you were to go El Smasho on them and push them 12 or 13 thousandths in, that could be a completely different story. I did not test that. But within a window, it is not necessary to worry about how tall a primer is before you seat it, which makes a stopped priming tool probably quite effective. All right, guys, so in the end analysis, get your primers all into the pockets, and it doesn't appear to make that much difference if you have a little crush or a slight amount more crush or no crush at all, at least not for my rifle with the Federal 210M primer. It might be different with a different primer, it might be different with a different rifle, but that's up to you to figure out. All right, guys, until next time, stay safe.
do some testing because it does make a difference. And I'll see you in the next video.